So over the weekend, I got to play the uh, pre-alpha free weekend for a game in development called Fantasy Strike uh, by Serlin Games. Uh, so Fantasy Strike is from the mind of David Serlin, a longtime FGC expert, analyst, and game designer, and also author of the uh, 2000 uh, fighting game uh, source and inspiration guide called uh, Playing to Win. Uh, so this is uh, kind of his fighting game brainchild, and also if the art and characters seem kind of familiar, you may have seen them before in a completely different game called uh, Yomi, which is a card game designed to play like a fighting game that featured all the same characters and art, and that is because they actually are. Uh, Fantasy Strike is Serlin's uh, main IP, and Yomi is the card game spinoff of Fantasy Strike, which is a little strange that the card game spinoff came first, but I mean, oh well, let's just uh, let's just keep that as it is. So, what is Fantasy Strike? What's the deal with it? Well, Fantasy Strike, as it's explained, is fighting games simplified down to its to its very core, so that depth is immediately accessible to anyone picking up the game. Uh, so what this means is that we're looking at an extremely simplified button scheme so that we've removed all pretenses and pre-contexts of, like, execution and high skill ceilings and all that is gone and all that's left is pure mind games, mix-ups, reads, all the stuff that makes fighting games good and deep at a higher level that is normally inaccessible through things like high execution barriers. Uh, so think of it like, kind of like dive kick in a way, except not a joke. So how this works? How this works is based on how they've laid out the button scheme. So this is a 2D game. Characters move in 2D movement only. You can only move forward, backwards, and jump. There's no dashing, there's no back dashing, there's no air dashing, there's no super jumping. So it's a kind of core Street Fighter 2 type movement. Interesting to note, however, is that there's no crouching in the game. So you're never going to worry about attack elevations, and you're not actually going to worry about either attacks hitting low or hitting overhead. Therefore, the only ways to block are standing and, well, the other way around. So it, it, it's all based on your facing, which means there are a lot of characters who have ways of getting behind you and doing all sorts of tricky cross-ups. Um, there are, at minimum, only three buttons in the game. Uh, there is an attack button, there's a special button, and there's a special two button. So there are two special buttons. So think of it kind of like Smash Brothers, where there was one attack button and one special button, but there are two instead. Uh, you have a set number of normals based on your attack button, which, uh, like Street Fighter, they're, they're not like dial A combos. Uh, they'll, they'll just give you a straight normal. You can do a forward normal and a back normal per character, and you have jumping normals as well. Uh, jump is normally, by default, mapped to a button, so that is also similar to Smash Brothers in a sense, uh, but you can uh, re uh, set the controls to map jump to an up direction, like a traditional fighting game. Uh, I ended up doing that because it just feels more comfortable for me. Um, so you can, that, that is also an option as well. And you can also use a super attack by either mapping a button to it or by pressing uh, both special buttons at once. So at minimum, you can play the game with three buttons but you can add a jump or super button if you wish. Uh, so this means, in total, every character is going to have at least three, or at most, three ground normals, two ground specials, a jumping normal, sometimes more, two jumping specials, a super on the ground, and a super in the air. And this plays in interestingly with what the moves actually do because of how health and damage is, is designed in the game. Uh, instead of having one long continuous bar of health that uh, chips away different amounts of damage based on what you get hit by, characters actually have a very distinct set number of HP bars to represent their entire health meter. Uh, getting hit by a single attack will take off one bar, so really all this means is that if you get hit this many times, you die. It's KO. That's it. And rounds can go by very quickly as a result, which is interesting because it then boils down to how you avoid getting these situations. So uh, there is a, uh, there is chip damage in the game, so because blocking does exist, it means there needs to be a way to either reward pure aggression or to punish cowardly play. 
So chip damage happens when you block too many times, and it'll just take one bar of health off of you if you if that if you've been blocking too much within that one bar. And oh, I forgot to mention, uh, throws are important also. Throws are going to be a big part of the game because again, there are no highs or lows or overheads or, or and such. So your mix-ups come from either left, coming from right, front attacks, cross-ups or throws. Throw, and because of the way health works, throws are a big deal. You lose a whole chunk of health for it. However, uh, to escape throws is what they, get, they call in-game a Yomi counter. In order to perform a Yomi counter, you have to be pressing absolutely no buttons whatsoever. It is actually the ultimate in mind games and reads. You have to know that a throw is coming and simply release all your buttons and your character will perform a Yomi counter. It'll escape a throw, and it'll deal a point of damage to the enemy. So you can easily turn a fight around with a well-placed Yomi counter if you can see that throw coming. Health for per character, you may notice it looks a little different, and that is because characters in the game are actually divided into classes to define what gameplay archetype they fall into. Uh, in the game, there are four zoner-type characters. Uh, that sounds a little alarming, considering how much I talk about how bad zoning is in Injustice 2, but bear with me for a second. There are four zoning characters, two rushdown characters, two grapple characters, and two characters that fall under the technical uh, category. And there are a few characters who are not in the game yet. I believe we were missing one zoner and we were missing one technical character. Uh, but I'll explain briefly. Zoner simply means that a character has a projectile of some kind. Uh one that is used to create space. Uh, so our basic uh, guy here, Grave, will have just a basic straight fireball. Uh, the archer, Jaina, is more of a real zoning character, where, she has, where her toolkit is comprised of a variety of projectiles and such. And we have uh, Geiger, the clockmaker, who uh, actually fits the guile archetype of the charge character, or the patient defensive character. Which is interesting in a game where you can launch specials with one button. Uh, I want to talk about actually how they take complex fighting game mechanics and simplify them into this particular game. Uh, this is going to come up with both Geiger and Graves. So with Geiger in particular, he's supposed to be the Guile archetype. He has what's equivalent to a sonic boom, and he has what's equivalent to a flash kick. Now, if anyone knows anything about the special buttons mapped to a single button, this means you can walk forward and flash kick, which is something that Guile can't normally do because of the nature of charge characters. Normally, he's going to be sitting there crouching, or he's going to be sitting back holding uh, the back button to make sure he has a sonic boom or a flash kick ready to go. The way they emulate this in this game, with Geiger in particular, is he has a special meter on the bottom next to his bar where it shows you when he is ready to use a special move. When this cog icon is full, he can use any of his specials, and he has to wait for it to fill up again before he can do it again. So he can use he can use his projectile here, or he can use his flash kick whenever it's full. However, the bar empties whenever he steps forward. So you can't simply walk forward and flash kick. You have you, when you walk forward, you have to recognize that you are releasing your charge on your specials, and you must wait again before you can use them. So it creates a really interesting situation where you can play patiently with him and achieve that guile experience. Or you can take the risk and move forward and not have access to your specials, but you'd be able to move forward for once. Now, there is a super meter in this game, which is, uh, it plays an interesting role because of how damage works in this game. Uh, super, as you think, you typically in a fighting game is when you want to turn a fight around and when you want to just deal big, big damage to an enemy. But in a game where damage is always preset to a number of uh, health meters per hit, supers have a different function. Most of them are designed around utility, and some of them are built for damage in cases where uh, dealing lots of damage is actually a difficult situation, like like this, like this, Jaina's uppercut super, you want to be at point blank to run it, and it has a dangerous, dangerous uh, negative uh, frame if you miss, uh, but if you hit, you're rewarded by dealing two damage. Uh, likewise, the grappler character, Rook, has the only move in the game right now, I believe, that deals three damage at once, which to some characters is half their health, if not more. And of course, being a grappler means he has to take the risk of being within throw range to activate the super, so that's its also obvious risk and reward payoff. Uh, but other supers will either only deal one damage or just not deal any damage at all. Uh, you have supers like uh, Setsuki the Ninja, who you can tag it at the end of any combo, just throw in an extra damage, which is great. 
it turns a, three, a two damage combo into a three damage combo, which is 50% of most characters, or a three damage combo into a four damage combo, which will end a match very quickly depending on who you're fighting. Um, or you have uh, Valerie the Painter, who has a very a uh, anti-air focus super or like a wake up super that she can use just to tag on one extra damage and get her out of situations. Or she has this sort of tandem top looking super, which she can use to set up for big damage combos. Uh, the most interesting one I think I feel is actually Geiger, the clockmaker. His super uh, on the ground uh, doesn't deal any damage really. All it does is it frees a time and puts him into this little dandy spread and moves him a set distance forward while nothing else can happen in the game. Everything else is frozen. Uh, what this means is that he gets he, he can use his meter to reposition, uh, to place himself in a spot where he where he was not anticipated to be, and he can also set up for long combos using his sonic boom. So imagine throwing a sonic boom and then just casually strutting forward ahead of it in order to land a few hits before the sonic boom hits and then continue your combo. That's that is some straight utility super right there. Easily worth the meter. Uh, now meter in this game actually fills up automatically over time. Which makes sense in a game where characters can only take a few hits before they die, because typically you want to hit a character a bunch of times in order to build your super, but if you can only hit a character five times in a match before they die, then it's unfun for anyone to have to wait to wait that long to hit their super, and it makes characters players even more reluctant to use them if they know they're, they'll ever get it back without having to win a whole round. Uh, because supers are basically on a timer now, supers have the, a much higher presence in battle, and having it available will always change what a character can do. Uh, so with Setsuki, the ninja, for instance, you always have to watch out for the idea that she can punish you from across screen, or, or from most of the screen, and deal one straight damage to you if you're not careful. Uh, uh, DeGray, the technical character, has a counter super. So if you see that he's got his super meter full, you have to start approaching him differently because you know he'll just land the counter and score straight two damage on you, and that's devastating. Anyway, uh, so let's move on to my impressions of the actual presentation of the game so far. Um, this is a pre-alpha, so I understand that a lot of things are going to look very rough. Uh, they have a very, um, it's not, I wouldn't say primitive, but I would say it's the sort of simplified cel-shaded art style here. Uh, reminiscent of some, some older cel-shaded games like Jet Set Radio or Okami, even. And, um... I think it looks good in some cases. I, I, in particular, I feel like the graphic style of the special effects looks great alongside the sort of bold cartoon shading. Uh, some of the like some effects, like the fire effect of uh, Setsuki's kick, or the slash effects of uh, Graves' sword, or uh, oh, oh, the, the paint effects for Valerie's paintbrush, actually, I feel, I feel are actually fantastic. Uh, the way this style looks, I love the sort of hand-drawn look of a special effects say, in a fighting game. Uh, as far as the characters go, um, the art style in particular, I think, needs a bit more refinement in terms of being able to give characters more expression and personality and a bit more differentiation, really, because, I, again, I get that it's pre-alpha and they're probably using, like, a bunch of placeholder models with uh, rudimentary, like, design over them to make sure that every character is in the game. Uh, but right now, it looks kind of like... Um, and I hate to use the term, but it does kind of kind of look like an Overwatch light. Uh, it seems to have that sort of East meets the West uh, heroic cartoon, halfway cartoon, halfway comic appeal that Overwatch has made popular in the last uh, three years or so. And I, it's a it's a shame too because if Overwatch were not a thing and Fantasy Strike came out looking the way it does, I'd feel like it looked good. But uh, right now, I do feel like. The characters need a bit more personality, uh, but this is pre-alpha, so obviously we're missing a lot of a lot of assets like dialogue and voice and animated facial expressions. You'll notice characters like don't really emote whenever they do supers or get get hit by supers, and that's just going to be a thing that'll be fixed over time. But it's really going to come down to, I, I guess, voice work and performance and really bringing these characters to life. Uh, about the presentation in UI, everything here is, is pretty rudimentary, and um, you may notice some very obvious parallels in presentation to other popular games. I already mentioned Overwatch, and you can tell the splash screen is kind of modeled after that. Uh, even the VS screen here is uh, the, the tried and true Street Fighter method. Um, 
obviously we can we can fancy this up over time as this goes along. Um, and but uh, I do I think it works. I mean, you, you don't need to fix what's not broken. It's functional. It's worked for other games, so for pre-alpha, it means we'll get something functional working. The character design is something I feel a little strangely about because I know these characters first from Yomi. And the artwork in Yomi is very refined and very, very detailed. Uh, you've got the beautiful Genzo Man art uh, on full display with Yomi, uh, which looks great in single pictures. Uh, but the design of the characters I feel coming out of Yomi, at first I thought they would not translate well into a real fighting game in terms of visibility, in terms of detail, level of detail, in terms of portraying what a character is meant to do. And uh, seeing them appear in Fantasy Strike, I'm a little less worried about it now uh, because the models in Fantasy Strike have taken some liberties to simplify a lot of the complex complexities of the designs in Yomi. So the characters do feel a bit more presentable, and the uh, th there's a lot less like, detail on detailing on them that would make it overwhelming to look at on a 3D model and from a model of that distance. Um, but again, like I was saying about the graphics and the style, uh, it's we're missing personality here, which I hope will be added over time. Um, it's going to come down to how a character emotes, how a character expresses and being able to sell out who this person is immediately right off the bat. Because right now we're looking at, um, I mean, we were looking at a bunch of archetypes which are already defined by their role in Yomi, but I mean, we, we, we've got a character select screen that literally shifts our entire cast into boxes full of functions for us, to bring an old meme back. Um, which is good because it helps players understand what a character is about immediately when they pick them, but it's also kind of, uh, I, f I feel it makes it so that we're designing characters around a function rather than designing a character for a character's sake. Now the game itself, uh, the game itself actually feels fantastic. Uh, just being able to, the, to fire off specials in one button, one or two buttons, actually feels great. Uh, I spent a lot of time playing as the Rushdown characters, uh, Setsuki and Valerie. Uh, Setsuki is a lot of fun. Uh, Zetsuki is basically, uh, the time I spent with Zetsuki made me wish I were good with Ibuki, but I don't have that kind of, I can't meet that skill ceiling, but I, I understand the feel and the goal that Serlon was after by playing a Zetsuki because I'm able to achieve all of this tricky mix-up nonsense and resets and vortex and all this stuff using the Ninja character, and I don't have to learn how to do one frame blinks or plinks or wave dashing or or all this bullshit nonsense uh valerie i feel is also extremely fun but i think she might be a little too powerful for this game actually uh valerie uh main is main Mal valerie's main gimmick is that she is the Rekka character so she is about chaining a whole bunch of attacks together which in a game where characters will have as little as five hp is a little devastating she, uh, like, Valerie lands a good combo, and she will chew through your health like it's not even, like it's not a problem. Like, she, she'll, like, she, she'll, she can very easily land upwards of 50% to 70% of a character's health in a single combo. Uh, even characters I was struggling against, like grapple characters. Grapple characters have about 9 HP. That is almost double the amount of a rushdown character, and Valerie was handling them just fine. So, I'm not sure what you would, what I would do to nerf uh, Valerie, I don't think I would. I would just kind of maybe give other characters a way to, um, or no, 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 no. I would, I, I would say Valerie. I wouldn't change her core kit. I would maybe give her more vulnerabilities, maybe make a lot more things unsafe because as it is, like she gets, she has good range, good distance on her brush, and most of it will confirm into a into a big chain of Rekkas, which is which will guarantee about fifty percent of a character's health right in one go. In my time playing, I felt that. Um, Midori, the uh, the old man who turned into a dragon. I feel like his dragon form is a little strong. He stays in there for such a long time, and he can whip out like as many two damage attacks as he wants. This will this will end a character in three th uh, in three moves or so for the average health character, and he still gets to keep dragon form as the round continues. So. Um, or, or maybe it's just a really bad matchup for Setsuki. I'm not sure. That could, that could just be the case. I've never tried fighting uh, Midori with Jaina with a pure zoning character, so I imagine that might be a nightmare in and of itself. Uh, 
But I mean, the game itself feels good. I can immediately jump into mind games and zoning and mix-ups and not have to worry about not being able to land that plink and dropping my combo entirely. And that's, that is the best part of the game. I feel the game succeeds where it was aiming for. There is an online quick play for this weekend demo, and I tried it for a bit, and I see it's using rollback netcode, but it's not entirely there. I get a lot of jittery matches, and I get a lot of matches where I can't see what I or the enemy is doing, and I'm not sure if this is just because I was recording at the time I was playing, but even playing without recording, I ended up getting into some rather jank matches, and I can't tell where my opposition is from, so I can't really gauge uh, what the connection issue might actually be. Uh, now, I also noticed at the end of these ranked matches that I started gaining player levels and ranks, as well as character ranks as well. And I was confused about this at first until I go, went to the main med website and found that they do plan on integrating a progression system and a loot box system into the game where you can open boxes for purely cosmetic items. And I'm hoping it'll stay that way, uh, where the loot boxes are for cosmetics only. I don't want to see characters hidden by loot boxes or special moves hidden by loot boxes or stages hidden by loot boxes because we want we want access to all the things that make the game playable. But if we just want a new cosmetic, then yeah, I'll go to a loot box for that. Uh, loot boxes have just been cropping up in every game. I want to say since Overwatch, but I know it's been going on beforehand. And frankly, I, it's a trend I would not miss if it weren't away. Uh, if, especially if we just went back to the old fighting game method of unlocking by, you know, just straight playing the game, getting a certain ending, or unlocking an achievement with a certain character, or just doing something like that. Those, those were the days. I think we can still bring that back. But going forward, I do see Fantasy Strike has a lot of work ahead of it. Uh, there's a lot of placeholder moves I must get rid of because we have a set of moves in the game that are very much lifted from existing moves in other games. Um, I'm sure that'll be corrected over time because we want to be able to have, we want to be able to maintain that character function, but we don't want to be necessarily ripping off that entire move for people. Uh, that's something I think that can be easily avoided. And just as well, um, I actually really want to see where this game goes. I do hope this game gets coverage because it is fun to play, and I feel more car more players do need access to a very easy to pick up fighting game. So they, can, so they can understand the depth of what happens in a high-stakes match. They can understand the idea of mind games, and the idea of Yomi, the idea of being in your enemy's head, and simply having the tools at your disposal to deal with whatever they're about to do. So that's been my first impression of Yomi. Uh, I'm ABI, and uh, if there's any other games coming out soon, I'd like to know in terms of open beta or something, or open alpha or something. And if any of you were actually in the alpha as well, I'd like you to tell me what you thought of uh, Fantasy Strike. Uh, so I'll see you all later.